couple days ago, some man accused me uh, on Facebook of uh, bashing men too much. I've heard that accusation before, and so I have a resource here that I've, I've written for him and for the other men who have made a similar accusation. And so thank you so much for watching uh, this video and the podcast. If you want to read the article, you're welcome to do that. The title of it is Mean Wives and Husbands Who Should Love Them. By the way, if you're watching on YouTube or Rumble, uh, if you would uh, be so kind as to subscribe to either one of those platforms, I would appreciate it. All right, let me get into this article. I have been accused, and that is my word, not their word, of writing too much about how husbands need to change of course, all of my accusers happen to be husbands, and I have heard this complaint for many years now, probably the entire time that this ministry has been in existence, and I am not going to argue or defend myself because these husbands just may be right in their accusations. I do think a lot about husbands. And I do that for two reasons. One is I am one, and I want to emulate what Jesus talked about in Matthew 7 that we want to address the log in our eye before we go speck fishing. And so my general default is to think about myself as a Christian man, Christian husband, Christian father. And so I do think a lot about husbands as they have accused me of. Also, uh, men should be servant leaders to their families. And so again, I want to think about how I can change. But I do realize that our content is evergreen. And what I mean by evergreen is that our content, it is practically applicable at any season in any generation. It's not time dated content that only has a 48 hour shelf life. But what I write about is stuff that you can apply anytime, anywhere, and also to any person. And so though I might be writing about Biff, I believe that our community is smart enough and humble enough. And I also believe that if they want to change, even if I'm writing about Biff, Mabel's going to listen to this content and, and she's going to say, wow, you know, I think uh, that applies to me too. And that is what a humble person will do. And so in my view, whether I'm writing about men or women is virtually irrelevant. Uh, if a person wants to change, they will find what they're looking for uh, through our ministry and they can make those changes. However, so uh, because of the accusation and for all the husbands everywhere, I'm going to talk about those mean wives in this video, this podcast, in this article, and husbands who must work extra hard to love them well. Hello, everyone. This is Rick Thomas. You're listening to the Life Over Coffee podcast, and that is the title of this resource, Mean Wives and Husbands Who Should Love Them Well. You can watch the video, listen to the podcast, or you can read the article. The reason that I've titled this resource that way is because if you are married to a mean wife, she's not going to hear anything that I have to say. And so that's why I added mean wives and husbands who, uh, love, who should love them well, because this resource is really for the husband. But I do want to talk about mean wives. And, and I, I do want to be honest and transparent with with everything that we create here, I understand total depravity, and I know that it's true. I know that there are outlier women out there who, the anomaly women that, that are mean women. I mean, I interact with them. There's no question about it. They do exist, and we want to make sure, it's not about being fair. Uh, we want to make sure that we are building resources that are redemptive, and this is a necessary uh, resource. But I also know that if a husband experiences transformation in his life, if he experiences transformation into a person who can practically live out the Bible while serving his family, in doing the same, in most cases, his wife will follow him in gospel-centered applications. A woman would virtually have to be insane not to follow a, a 
a man who loves God and loves others more than himself. In fact, I would have to rack my brain to think of a situation where a woman refused to follow a humble Christian man. But I know that there are outlier wives. There are anomalies. There are some women out there who are just downright mean, and you probably know one. I would imagine, even though the percentages are low within the Christian community. Again, most wives are more than willing to follow their God-centered, God-following husbands when they are leading biblically. And we should expect this kind of humble submission from our wives, which is why I do make many appeals to men to lead like Jesus even though there are exceptional women who would not follow and would not submit to their husbands, even if they were the most exacting replica of Jesus Christ. Their husband may not be perfect, but you get the sense that it would not change her into a glowing reflection of his church, even if he were. She's downright mean. She's snarky. She's unforgiving. She's generally brutal to love. Typically, the problem with this kind of woman is that there is a pre-existing condition that was there that predates the man that she married, and that is the first point that I want to make. And it's essential that a husband understands this. It would be exceptional for this woman to become mean at the marriage altar. In most cases, in a situation like this with a, a mean wife, uh, there was a man in her life before she ever met her husband, and usually that man is her father. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But first, I want to talk about this idea of being victimized because it is so predominant in our culture. There is a danger in taking on a victim mindset or a victim mentality, whether it's a man or a woman, it doesn't matter. But when a person is victimized, let's say that they are legitimately hurt by someone else. I'm not going to uh, say that it's not true because we all have been victimized, but there's a difference between being victimized in a moment of time and it being just a short period to being a victim for an extended period, meaning that we have not learned how to cast our victimness. We haven't learned how to cast our sin on the true victim who is Jesus Christ. If a person has been hurt, in the illustration that I'm using here, a, a wife who has been hurt or victimized by, let's say, her father, and it has carried on into her, not just her childhood, but into her teenage years and carried on into her marriage, then she is a true long-term victim, victim mentality, victim mindset, victim-centered, and that is not how she, that, she's not built to live that way. And what will happen with these type of victims, long-term victims, not short-term temporary victims who know how to cast their victimness on Christ, what will happen with these long-term victims is that they will begin to take a moral high ground. And when they take this moral high ground where they start looking down on other people, they will sanitize their thoughts, their words, their actions. And that is a dangerous individual. And there are many mean women. I call them the shrill community. It's part of the abuse culture that we see in Christianity that they have been legitimately victimized by whomever and they have sanitized their morality to where they do not even see that what they, what they think, what they say, and what they do is very sinful. And that is a danger, and this is something that a husband will have to think through as he's interacting with a mean wife. One of the essential keys for the husband in this kind of marriage is to keep this idea in mind that the things currently wrong with her did not begin when she married him. She brought the baggage of her former manner of life into her marriage. This is what Paul talked about in 422 
of Ephesians. We all have a former manner of life. And if this wife has not learned how to cast her victimness on Christ, she will have a deeply ensconced and captivated former manner of life that will have convinced her that she is a victim more than likely, she will be tempted to take that moral high ground to where she will be blind to her own blindness, be blind to her own sinful attitudes. The big idea in that the sinfulness, the meanness that's happening in marriage predates her is that people do not just become mean in an instant, even more any more than a stalk of corn just magically appears on a summer day. There are many days of quiet growth that ensue long before he first laid eyes on her as a potential date. And like the rest of us, she came from the dinged and dented section of the grocery store. She didn't come from that middle shelf where everything is new and glossy and it says new and improved. No, we all are totally depraved. We're in that basket on that shelf back at the restrooms in the grocery store where everything is dinged, dented, and damaged. That's where she came from. And it's important that the people that we marry are just like that. More than likely, a mean woman like this thought marriage would rectify or help some of her pre-existing problems. Many times, they look at their husbands as rescuers. We call that we we call them the uh, Prince Charming. That he is my Prince Charming, and and he's going to be the one uh, that's going to rescue me from my dysfunctional past. Prince Charming, a way of defining that, is a functional God who would salvage her from her bad past. That in itself is a setup for marriage failure. There is always a long history of wrong attitudes and expectations that predates anyone's current meanness. Things like fear and discouragement, insecurity, patterns of justifications and rationalizations, anger, dissatisfaction, and illogical thinking are some of the culprits that can captivate a mean wife's thought life. And what a husband will have to do is that he will have to discern these culprits. He wants to study her, as, as Peter taught us in 3.7, that we live with them in an understanding way. Not just categorize all the things that are wrong with her, but uh, to be able to have a current have a current understanding of what is going on about her behavior, so that you can speak into that behavior intelligently and biblically, because whatever is going on right now has a long tail, and that tail reaches back into her childhood and into her teenage years. Talking about the father, as I mentioned earlier, it could be that she had that over-the-top mean, angry, authoritarian, heavy-handed father. That can cause all kinds of repercussions in a child's life. It could be that the father was, was quite passive and maybe the mother was a controller and the home was upside down. Well, an upside down home can have an adverse effect on a little girl as well. And so there could be other forms of dysfunction as well. Maybe she was sexually molested. I want to give you a few samples of what could have, what life could have been like for her uh, before you met her, dated her, and married her. And the reason I want to give you a few samples is because if you are going to come alongside her to help her redemptively, which you must do, I want you to be able to have peripheral vision, to be able to see maybe some of the complexities. Because understanding her is essential because you want to help her to put off that former manner of life. But if you don't know what that former manner of life is, then it will be hard for you to help her to put it off. And so here are five samples. It's not an exhaustive list, but it, it will just help you to be able to think and, and then maybe you can fill in some blanks as to, as to how your wife actually is if she is that mean wife. For example, if your wife blames her actions on someone else, meaning on you, the husband, well, what that says is that she is an insecure person who refuses to admit guilt. 
It is a bad habit from her past. It is hard for her to own the things that are wrong with her because she lived in a conditional relationship. People who lived in conditional relationships, like, say, with an authoritarian father, it's hard for them to own that they have made a mistake, that they have done something wrong, and so they typically blame their actions on other people. Number two, she is critical. If she's critical, she's self-righteous, meaning she's looking down on the person that she is criticizing, meaning that she views herself as better than her husband. She is elevated, again, a desire to feel better about herself, and so she looks down on another person, in this case, her husband. Number three, she has set the husband up as an idol. I talked about this earlier as being the Prince Charming, her rescuer. And so she expects him to keep her love cup filled. She has specific idols that she worships and she expects her husband to come and to fill that love cup and to meet the requirements of her idolatries. And she will grade him accordingly and even criticize him if, if he does not meet her expectations. Number four, she is an angry person. Now, that is obvious, but I want you to know, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but she is really angry at God, but she takes it out on her husband. Ultimately, sovereign God is not providing what she craves from the marriage, and she's frustrated, and the one that she takes it out on is the one that is in her sight lines, which is not God, but it is her husband. And then number five, for example, she could be an excessive spender. Uh, she uses materialism as an escape. And I use this like an addict. It's a drug of choice, and I just choose uh, excessive materialism. And it's a way of her satiating her self-centered, captivated heart. But you get the idea. And just in these five illustrations, here's the things that you heard. She is blaming. She's insecure. She's fearful, she's critical, she's self-righteous, she's idolatrous, she's angry, she's materialistic, and she's self-centered just in these five characteristics. Now, what I would want you to do is I would, want, I, I would hope that would jog your thinking, your imagination, and so that you can think specifically about what may be going on as far as the dynamics of your wife's former manner of life. Again, so you can come alongside her in a spirit of gentleness, as Paul talked about in Galatians 6, to restore her uh, so that she can be unhooked from these things that are ensnaring her. But the big idea is that these things did not appear after the wedding day. When a person sins against another person, there is no excuse and there's no right option but for the culprit to repent. In the case of the mean wife, she has a pre-existing condition, and the husband has to discern and identify her past sin constellation so he can help her change. Now, what happens often is that a husband gets ticked at his wife because she's not meeting his expectations. Now, he's right. She is failing, but rather than responding with a fire-for-fire fire mindset, he needs to challenge himself. Uh, he needs to take himself by the nap of the neck, and he needs to cooperate with the Lord by coming alongside her to help her into transformation. Perhaps the Lord will grant her repentance. But regardless, somebody has to act like Jesus in this marriage, and the assumption is that it must be the husband. One of the other things that I would want the husband to know is that he cannot make her happy. And so he is that Prince Charming, probably, in the wife's mind. But he can't make her happy. And making her, if he tried to make her happy, he would be missing the primary problem in the marriage. To soothe her by feeding her idolatries is a setup of the functional God in her life, which is not what you want to do. If she is mean, or if she attempts to manipulate the husband to satiate her idolatries, what I want from you to fill up my love cup, he cannot acquiesce. She needs to experience God redemptively rather than him reacting improperly by trying to meet her idolatries. 
She needs Jesus more than she needs him. And he is exhibit A to what Jesus should be looking like in their relationship, practically speaking. Ultimately, Christ is where she will find satisfying happiness. Everybody has a God. It's either a little G-O-D or it's a capitalized G-O-D. It is either the Lord or it is something else that we have created as a God replacement. We will find true happiness when we are fully satisfied in God alone. Any other attempt to find solace for the soul is an insatiable pursuit of the elusive pot at the end of the proverbial rainbow. There is no hope in those endeavors. The difference between a God of her making and the true and living God are matters of three idols that she would be worshiping. One is control. Who's going to be in control, her or God? Authority, who's going to be the authority, either her or God? These are the temptations going on in her soul. And submission, will her husband submit to her and meet her idolatrous cravings, or will she submit to God? If he tries to become the source of her happiness, he will have to meet all of those expectations. And when he does not come through, according to her desires, She will critique him as a failure, and there will be repercussions. And so the three big questions that she will have to wrestle with, who is going to be in control, her or God? Who is the final authority, her or God? And who is going to submit to whom? Will she submit to God, or is she manipulating guests like her husband to submit to her? The angry wife is an idolater looking for whatever means she can find to satisfy the fears and the longings of her soul. Because she is looking to her husband as the primary source of her happiness, she's trying to control him, she's trying to have authority over him, and she will not submit to him or God. If she chooses to submit to the Lord, she will have to give up the, these control, authority, and submission idols. She needs a target for her bitterness, so she lashes out at her husband because he is the only viable option. He is in the sight lines. Those traps that predated their relationship has caught her, and she will blame him for whatever is going wrong. This predicament reminds me of the snarky comment that Martha made to Jesus when she wanted her brother Lazarus healed. You may remember that in John eleven twenty one. it says this, Martha saying to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Sometimes a mean wife will say unkind things. And in those moments, it is imperative that he keeps the big picture in mind as Jesus did there in John 11. An eye for an eye methodology is the old school way of reacting to sinful people. We live in another day. If a husband does not guard his heart, he will take it personally and he will snap back at her. This approach will never, ever work, which he probably already knows. She does not need his punishment but she needs his Christ. If he sends back at her, he will be just like her. One of the things that surprised me about how people process marriage conflict is that they do not have a practical awareness of the doctrine of sin. Sometimes in counseling, I just want to stand up and say, what did you expect? I am not sure if we are naive, if we're dense, if we're dumb, if we're absent-minded or if we're blinded to our cravings, we live in a sinful world. People sin. This characteristic is one thing that we all do swimmingly well. Sin is my greatest strength, and I'm sad to say that. And I've been trying to put it to death ever since regeneration, and as of this morning, it is still not dead. The gospel-centered husband perceives this Adamic problem and can set aside his expectations to serve his wife. 
He does not take it personally, not the gospel-centered husband, but he understands the true nature of the situation. He wants to view things from a different perspective. We see this need for a God-centered perspective in the Old Testament when Samuel ran up against some selfish people who did not like his ideas. You read in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 7, it says this, And the Lord said to Samuel, quote, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. That is such an important text of Scripture. Samuel took it personally. He had a good idea, and he thought everyone would be on board. When they did not cooperate, he was discouraged. Samuel went into self-pity mode and needed the Lord's corrective care. A mean wife is not rejecting her husband, but she is rejecting the Lord. When we sin, when you and I sin, we ultimately reject the Lord no matter who we direct our sin toward. The selfish Israelites launched their disappointment toward Samuel, even though it was not about Samuel. Samuel was only an advocate for the Lord. Advocacy is part of the job description of the husband of a mean wife. God has called husbands to love, to learn, to lead their wives. Husbands are doing the Lord's work. We must never forget this objective. If we get caught up in what we are not getting and toss a grenade in the wife's direction, there is no hope for our marriages. But if we allow the Lord to correct us as he corrected Samuel, our perspective will change. And he will give us the grace to serve our wives, hopefully helping them experience complete restoration to the Father. To do this well, we have to answer the biggest question of all, which is why God brought the husband of a mean wife into the marriage. Suppose what I've said here is accurate and your wife closely fits within the framework of what I have laid out here, meaning point number one, her problems predate you. Point number two, she can, you cannot make her happy. Point number three, she is rejecting God. If these things are accurate, then you must wonder why Sovereign Lord brought you two together. It is as, it's a thought worth pondering, and the scriptures do not leave you scratching your head on such matters. May I speculate with you? Is it possible the Lord knew the soul condition of your wife before you ever met her? Is it possible his desire has always been for her to find satisfaction in him alone? Is it possible the Lord brought you into this marriage for such a time as this? We do not serve a haphazard, catch-as-catch-can God. He is a premeditative God. He knows the future. Sometimes he prepares suffering for us because he works a higher purpose in our lives. Are you in faith to serve this kind of God? God placed Joseph in Egypt so he could receive the people who needed his help. Through the means of disappointment and broken dreams, Joseph was put in Egypt to steward a sovereign opportunity. Are you willing to become God's man for your wife so you can lead her out of her bondage? You have a choice. You can act similar to your wife by becoming just as snarky, demanding, and mean as she is, or you can choose to endure the current suffering because you have a future vision of what pure joy could be like in your home. The title of this podcast, the article, the video is Mean Wives and Husbands Who Should Love Them Well. What I would encourage you to do is that you read this article at the end of it. I have several questions for you. There are six of them all together. And I would encourage you to read these questions. I would also encourage you that you uh, print off this article. You can scroll to the bottom of it and you can print it off and you can share it with a friend. Find a guy who is a, a Paul to you, someone who is spiritually ahead of you, someone who maybe has been through the crucible of suffering, someone who can speak into your life. And I want you to share. There's six questions here. And again, you can find them 
uh, inside this article. There's also the video here. Then there's the podcast. All of this is embedded. There's also links here that will help you to do a deep dive into this study on marriage and conflict and anger. Again, the title of it is Mean Wives and Husbands Who Should Love Them. And then finally, let me encourage you to get this book. This book is titled Change Me. Uh, it's called The Ultimate Life Change Handbook. You can find it on Amazon. Just type in Rick Thomas and Change Me and you will find it. You can order it. They will ship it right to your door. Uh, but this is an excellent book. There are a couple hundred pages here uh, at the end of each chapter. There are call to actions that you can work through and it will help you change, which would also position you to be able to come alongside your wife. So in addition to this resource, I would encourage you to get that one as well. And then of course, if you have any questions that you want to ask us, just please jump on our website and ask those questions. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast.